And you're good to go. Thank you very much. So uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Transportation Standing Committee meeting of August 25th, 2022. I'm your host, Wade Mason, chair of this committee. Uh, we don't have a very long uh, committee uh, today, so we decided to stay virtual uh, out of respect for it being August and all. So I'm going to call this meeting to order. Uh, first off, I'd like to acknowledge that Halifax Regional Municipality is located in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and traditional lands of the Mi'kmaq people. The municipality acknowledges the peace and friendship treaties signed in this territory and recognizes that we are all treaty people. So as we are uh, virtual, we'll go through a quick roll call. Uh, I know uh, Councillor Stoddard may be joining us later, our Vice Chair, uh, Councillor Mancini. Mr. Chair, colleagues, uh, good afternoon to everyone. Yep, we can hear and see you. Uh, Councillor Paul Russell. Uh, good afternoon from Lower Sackville, and it, it is unfortunate that we can hear and see Councillor Mancini some days. No meeting Thank you, Councillor Russell. Uh, Councillor Outfit. Speaking of unfortunate to see and hear, good segue to me. I'm here as well. Thank you. Never. Uh, and uh, do we have, uh, did we get regrets from Councillor Kent? I, I think we did. Did we, uh, Katie? Uh, I haven't received any regrets, so hopefully she, she will be may, joining She may soon. join us. Uh, is our hello. solicitor, Colin, T oh, hello, Beck. Hello, Councillor. <laughs> Councillor Stoddard. Hi. Mike, check and visual works. I see you, Colin. Can I hear you? I am here. Can you hear me? Perfect. Uh, thank you for coming, all of you, on this great August day. And of course, uh, Katie Campbell is holding it all together for us down at City Hall. Uh, so uh, we'll move to item two, approval of minutes of June 23rd, 2022. Would someone care to move the minutes? I so move. We'll second that. Thank you, Vice Chair. Second by Councillor Russell. Any further discussion on the minutes? Seeing none, we'll move to a vote. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Carries unanimously. Approval of the order of business and approval of additions and deletions. Madam Clerk, are there any additions and deletions to the agenda? There have been no additions or deletions. Thank you. Uh, members of the committee, do you have any additions or deletions or modifications to the order of business? Seeing none, I'll call for a motion to approve the agenda as presented. So moved. Moved by Councillor Russell. Seconded by? Councillor Outfit, uh, any further discussion on the motion to approve the agenda? Seeing none, we'll move to a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Uh, there is no business arising out of the minutes. I will call for a declaration of conflict of interest. Does anyone have a uh, conflict with anything on the agenda today? Seeing none, we'll move on. There are no motions of reconsideration, none of rescission, no consideration of deferred business. Uh, sorry, Paul, I uh, can't get to my phone right now. <laughs> no notices of table matters. Uh, uh, Madam Clerk, do we have uh, correspondence petitions and uh, any delegations? So there has been correspondence received. It's been general correspondence from Elizabeth Vickers, Dreenan, Martin Davidson, Mark Hobbs, and Martin Williams, and that has all been circulated to the members. And there is no petitions or presentations or delegations. Perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Clerk. Uh, so we'll move on to petitions. Are there any petitions uh, from any members of the committee? Seeing none, we have no presentations. There are no information items brought forward in item 11, which brings us to 12.1.1, staff report, Salfax Transit 2021-22, quarter four, KPI report. And uh, Dave Rigi or Patricia Hughes or, or Mark Zantilli, who wants to take this one? Uh, that'll be me. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Hey, Mark, please go ahead. Uh, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Thanks very much. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mark Santilli. I'm the manager of technical services for Halifax Transit. Today, I will be presenting the KPIs for quarter four of 2021-22 for Halifax Transit. And just a reminder that uh, 
quarter four is January, February, and March of this calendar year. So I will dive right in. So first up, a reminder of the transportation priority outcomes for us. We've got safe and accessible integrated mobility network, uh, connected and healthy long range mobility planning and net zero emissions. Uh, first on that list is the safe and accessible transportation network uh, of which we have, or for which we have five business plan deliverables. Uh, two are currently in progress and three are complete. And the highlights for this priority outcome are as follows. Uh, for our paratransit project, uh, the implementation of phase two of the paratransit project, which is again, the installation of mobile data terminal, terminals on each accessibus vehicle is progressing. Uh, the backend installation, uh, the end user training, uh, hardware installation plan and operator training are all complete. Uh, we are currently working through the actual physical hardware installation this week and next week. Uh, regarding the transit code, um, an anti-sexual harassment campaign was launched in mid-July. Uh, prohibited conduct signs are installed at all our terminals now. Uh, and immersive wall murals featuring the transit code eight principles were installed in mid-July. Uh, we have two upcoming passenger courtesy campaigns, one being uh, food and beverages on transit vehicles, and the other relates to backpacks and bags. Uh, and both these campaigns will be running between August and October of this year. And our accessible taxi service. Uh, this new service operating under the brand name Extra Care Taxi has eight vehicles in operations and is available for public trips. Uh, announcements and an official launch are being planned for September where the word about this service will be circulated more widely. Regarding our second priority outcome, connected and healthy long range mobility planning, we have uh, six deliverables here, two of which are complete and four are in progress. Uh, again, the highlights for these are as follows. Uh, for the Bears Road interim transit lane, uh, outbound transit lane on Bears Road from Windsor Street to Connolly Street was opened in late May of 2022. Uh, the new lane will help improve transit operations in the interim as the phase two construction between Windsor Street and Connaught Avenue is delayed to 23-24. And routing changes were also made to Regional Express Route 330 and Express Route 194 to allow these routes to benefit from this new transit priority measure. And on a personal note, I happen to take Route 330 and it is noticeable the improvement that this, uh, <laughs> this transit lane has made. Uh, West Bedford Park and Ride. Uh, there's still work happening on site. The new electronic message boards will be installed over the next month or so. Uh, and there's still a few outstanding elements, but the grand opening will be coming in the early fall. Uh, the Park and Ride is operational now. It's up and running and it is nearly complete. It's usable, uh, but a few finishing touches still to come. Mark, can I interrupt you just for a second? Mr. Chair, uh, Becky is trying to get in. and She's texted some of us that she's having trouble getting in. Can staff help her get connected? Yep, yeah. I'll send her the invitation again. Thank you, uh, Councillor Arthur. Please carry on, Mark. All right. Uh, and the Woodside Ferry Terminal. So the project achieved su substantial completion in June of this year. Uh, however, the final escalator inspection identified a code issue, uh, which requires the installation of escalator approximately eight weeks, which will delay the opening of the escalators to the Mark, fall your audio cut out there for a second. If you can back up to the beginning of uh, where you're talking about the escalators going in. Sure. Uh, the, the final escalator inspection identified a code issue, uh, which requires the installation of escalator guards. Uh, and the design and installation of these guards will take approximately eight weeks, uh, which will delay the opening of the escalators to the fall of 2022. And lastly, for this priority outcome, transit route changes. Uh, MFTP changes planned for November 2022 are postponed. Uh, when implemented, in addition to the changes outlined in the 22-23 annual service plan, routes four universities and 10 Dalhousie will be adjusted to travel on University Avenue between Lamarchant Street and Roby Street in order to improve on-street operations. Uh, so they'll no longer travel on Seymour Street or eastbound on Silk Street. The schedule adjustments to the Route 433 will be implemented in November to improve schedule adherence. And several minor route changes have taken place 
uh, as a result of road closures related to the Cogswell project. Uh, Route 8 and 9 endpoints were adjusted in August. Uh, and I believe also the regional express uh, routing uh, had to be changed uh, due to the, the Cogswell work that's happening. And finally, the net zero emissions priority outcome. We have two business plan deliverables. One is complete, one is in progress. Uh, the highlights for Q4 for the battery electric bus, bus project. Uh, the Ragged Lake Transit Center design phase began in March of this year. Uh, the schematic design phase is anticipated to be anticipated to be completed this month, and the detailed design and construction of uh, construction documents are anticipated to be completed before the end of November of this year. Uh, Council approved the proposal to purchase up to 60 battery electric buses and chargers in May 2022. The contract has been awarded to the successful bidder, which is Novabus. And uh, regarding our performance measures, our Q4 highlights, our overall boardings increased 11% this quarter from last year, while revenue increased 13.8%. Uh, average daily boardings in Q4 were 56,500 on weekdays, uh, just under 33,000 on Saturdays, and 22,500 on Sundays. Uh, System-wide on-time performance was 87% or 2% lower than Q4 last year. Uh, the departures line received over 2,000 passenger calls on a typical weekday this quarter. Access bus operated 6% more trips this quarter when compared to Q4 last year. And this quarter, 80% of customer feedback was resolved within service standards. Uh, the mean distance between failures for conventional service was 10,600 kilometers, a 20% increase from Q4 last year. Uh, the mean distance between service calls for conventional was... Uh, 5,900 kilometers, an increase of 37% from Q4 last year. The mean, mean distance between service calls for Accessibus was 37,600 kilometers, which is a 29% decrease from Q4 last year. Uh, the maximum daily number of buses that could not complete the scheduled service due to a mechanical defect was 12, while the daily average was just under five. And maintenance cost was uh, 1.35% two dollars per kilometer which is 2.4 cents lower than the budgeted cost and finally some performance measures for uh the overall year of 21-22 our on-time performance was 84 percent a decrease of four percent from last year overall boardings increased 24 percent from the previous year which is a positive sign that we are rebounding from the hit that we took during the pandemic uh, revenue increased by 49% overall compared to the previous year. Our average daily boardings were um, about 55,000 for weekdays, about 35,000 for Saturdays, and a shade under 26,000 for Sundays. Uh, the trips provided by the Accessibus increased by almost 35% from last year, or 37% from last year. And the average fuel price was 87 cents per liter, 34 cents higher than the budgeted cost per liter. Uh, the annual mean distance between failures for 21-22 was uh, 12,000 uh, kilometers, increasing 36% compared to the previous year. And maintenance cost per kilometer in 21-22 was $1.33 per kilometer, three cents lower than the budgeted cost of one thirty-six per kilometer. And that is the end of the presentation that we have. Thank you very much, Mr. Santilli. Uh, I would remind uh, the committee. Well, first of all, has Baker. Oh, there we've been joined by Councillor Kent. Do you want to say hello, Councillor Kent? Do a mic check. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm very pleased to be here finally. I was having trouble getting into the meeting. Thank yeah, you. Yes, so several of us didn't get the link uh, or in uh, in the invite, and several of us did. And we think that it's clear that Katie's picking was... favorites. Just, just kidding, Katie. Just kidding. Um, all right, so we'll move to questions. I'd ask uh, councillors to put the, uh, their names in the chat if they wish to speak. I know several people do. I also want to acknowledge that there are some people who have questions about the uh, current labor issues that have been reported in the news. I think we have to be very circumspect about those questions if you ask them here, and we may be told by either legal or by Mr. Santilli that we need to go in camera uh, if uh, at a certain point because of the nature of those discussions. But let's see what we can uh, do as much as possible in public. So we'll go to Councillor Outfit first. Councillor Arthur. 
Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mark, thanks for the presentation. Um, you did touch on the Bedford Park and Ride just quickly, and I'm just wondering if you could, uh, and maybe this isn't your your project, but uh, so far it's, it's open, but it's unfortunately a pretty well-kept secret, I think. And I'm just wondering if you could give me a little bit more information on how close we are to getting the heated, uh, the completion work, the signage, the heated shelters, and then we want to do a grand opening um, uh, sort of celebration, ribbon cutting, etc. I don't know if you or somebody online can just give me a little bit more information than what you touched on. Uh, sure, I, I, I think one of my colleagues would probably be better suited to, to answer this question than I would be. Sure. Are there other transit employees on the uh... Call there are. We're, we're all here. <laughs> well, hello to everyone. Are they all participants? Oh, here we go. There's Dave. Dave will take one for the team. Yeah, I'll take the uh, response by default. Um, so, uh, to the chair of the committee, uh, I think so. The, the biggest, um, the biggest lead time item right now that we're waiting on is the shelters. And I think that timeline's in the fall, but I can certainly confirm that uh, Councillor Earth didn't get back to you. Um, and I think. Once we have the information, maybe we should have a conversation about uh, at what point do we want to do the grand opening? And it, it might be that we just want to uh, get it done sooner than later. If that's going to be, uh, you know, too far into the future, because I know there are some, you know, hate the word, but supply chain issues around those shelters that seem to be pushing the timeline out. So uh, we'll grab that information and then perhaps we can uh, chat about that. All right. Thank you, Dave. And thank you for your help with an issue this morning as well. I appreciate it. Of course. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Rie. Thank you, Councillor Elthit. We'll move to Councillor Mancini. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just to clarify, uh, Mr. Rigi is referring to bus shelters, just to make sure everyone's clear on that one, versus the other type of shelters. Uh, Mark, thanks very much for the presentation. Uh, I do have a question about accessible taxi service. Uh, could you remind us again, because we've been talking about it a long time, and very excited that it's finally here. Could you explain again for, uh, for myself and my colleagues and those who might be watching, about how that surface is in relationship to what we've had in the past, and just a little kind of a rewind and uh, and how do people access that service and the costs and all those kind of things. Uh, Go ahead, sure. Mr. Tilly. All right, uh, thank you, Chair. Through you to the Councillor. Um, You'll have to forgive me because I'm not terribly familiar with with the service, but my understanding of the service and, and Dave, if you want to chime in to, to make sure I don't uh, <laughs> explain it incorrectly, is that it's a um, it is an accessible taxi service that we are um, helping to manage and, and we are uh, funding somewhat. So we are um, offsetting some of the costs for it uh, in terms of the actual launch. I know that the 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 Formal launch is coming uh, later this fall. Uh, and along with that will come a communications plan so that any uh, users hoping to take advantage of the service will be made available or will be made aware of, of uh, how they can access that service and, and all the details of, of, of getting access to it. Yeah, Mark, do you know, uh, is it the same price as uh, any other taxi or is it a little bit more? Uh, do you have any insight to that? Uh, that much, I, I'm not sure. I'm not. I'm not terribly familiar with uh, with with the, the details of it, Dave. If you want to, yeah, I think Dave's. Yeah, there. I, I, Dave's can certainly jump in, I can certainly jump in there. So yeah, so so it's priced the same as, uh, as as any other taxi service. So essentially, what we've done is uh, recognizing there was a gap in the industry in the accessible taxi realm. Um, we're essentially well, we've contracted out this company to provide the, the equivalent of, a, of an accessible taxi service, but it's just it's funded through uh, through HRM uh, to, to make it financially feasible for the vendors. So um, so they are up and running. Um, they're still uh, they're still kind of ramping up to full capacity, but from what I'm hearing, uh, things are going well. There there are operating trips, um, and you know they they have a website. Uh, they have an app you can download to book through that. Uh, there's different ways to contact them. Uh, you know, just like any other taxi. So from our perspective, we're here to kind of manage the contract, got it up and running. Um, the, the desire is that for the end user, uh, a taxi is a taxi. And these ones happen to be accessible, uh, work for people's needs. Um, but HRM just happens to be funding it uh, in order to make sure it can actually happen. 
Dave, is there uh, one more question? Is there any um, part of the contract or certain uh, times of operations that's that's mandated? You know, during peak times, of course. Uh, we've heard from many of our residents of HRM that need this type of surface. The, the difficult times they have is, you know, they're going out to dinner and our, our accessible program that we normally have maybe is not as uh, available. Uh, so is there any uh, guidelines of when they should be operating? And, and is there adjustment to that as we see people use it? You know, possibility of adjustment as needed. Yeah, certainly. Part of, part of the RFP that was issued and part of the contract does involve uh, some minimum standards in terms of uh, the number of vehicles you have to have available, um, the times of day and things like that. So um, I have to apologize. I don't have it here in front of me. It, would, it was in the staff report that, yep, uh, yep. Uh, that it was awarded, certainly. But yeah, so uh, because we recognize that as an issue um, that, you know, we, we've heard the stories of people, um, you know, 11 o'clock at night that there just were no caps Right. That's what we're trying to avoid is making sure that they are available uh, when people need them. Yep. No, uh, very excited about this. I think many of our residents will be too. So I just wanted a little bit of a refresher. Thank you for that. And I'll dig out that staff report again and try to share it with our residents. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dave. Uh, thank you, Mark. Thank you. I think we all uh, have uh, two residents who are emailing me pretty much every week asking when it's going to be launched, and we're all very excited to see that, fill that gap. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dave. Thank you, Councillor Mancini. We'll move to Councillor Russell. Thank you very much. I'm going to follow on that theme and uh, and ask about the accessible taxi service first. Um, we have, uh, th there are a number of organizations in town. Um, Prescott Group uh, is one of them. Um, uh, Building Futures is one of them. And they've got clubs where there are a number of people who would need that taxi service. Uh, and there are a number of people outside uh, Core Halifax, uh, Core Halifax and Dartmouth that would need that taxi service. And I'm wondering what a reasonable coverage would be. Uh, saying that it covers all of HRM is great, um, except that if you uh, are down in Tantel and, and, and you call it and they say, sorry, sorry, we don't have any available, there might be someone on Saturday. Um, that doesn't work all that well. So when someone calls the taxi um, from here, from somewhere slightly outside of the downtown core, uh, what can they expect from uh, from a coverage perspective? So the coverage generally is meant to mirror what is available uh, from the, the private sector taxi service. So, uh, you know, it's certainly not uh, limited to the, the urban center or anything like that. It, it does it does bring in uh, all the suburban areas. So, uh, because again, that was one of the, you know, the primary concerns we heard. Uh, I, I actually do I remember years ago, a specific example in uh, Lower Sackville, um, of someone being stranded by the, the privately operated taxi service. So that was part of our approach was to make sure that it is uh, mirroring, you know, if you can call up, you know, any of the private taxi companies and get a taxi, um, you should be able to contact this company and get an accessible taxi. So that, that's the that's the overall uh, you know, mission statement, I guess, for this organization and the, the service that they're contracted to provide. Okay. Okay, um, here, here's hoping it plays out that way. Um, one of the uh, charts in the, in the uh, report talked about uh, feedback. Um, and it says that uh, feedback is resolved within the standard. And I'm just wondering a little bit uh, about what that means. Does that mean that um, the phone call was answered, the, uh, the caller was spoken to, and um, the call was answered after a particular time, or if there is any remedial action, if there is a, a bus stop or, or a change to a bus pad, uh, if, if there's something that needs to be done as a result of that call, is that resolved in a reasonable standard or, or does it simply end at, we got to uh, you know 95% of the calls after, after just a couple of minutes, or what exactly does it mean that it was resolved? that one. Um, so my understanding would be that, like that doesn't necessarily mean like, in, the, in the example of, uh, of a bus stop, um, it wouldn't necessarily mean that you know if a, if a concrete pad had to be poured or something like that 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 was done. Uh, to, you know this is more about uh, getting back to the to, to the residents, uh, making the contact, and kind of closing off the communication loop there in terms of what's going to happen. That's that that standard, the customer service standard. Would be more of the like a contact center standard, I guess, than 
you know, another example would be if there's a request for a service change, um, whether or not the service change can actually be done. You know, we've contacted the resident, we've had the conversation and we've kind of closed off the communication. Okay, uh, bringing it to something more immediate, if a, if a bus pad needs to be shoveled because there's a lot of snow um, or if there's a repair that needs to be done, are there standards that would happen to something that is much more immediate? There would be other standards in some of those cases that wouldn't necessarily be the, the customer contact standard, I guess. Like we have standards with our contractors or things like snow clearance and that. So that wouldn't, this you're seeing here wouldn't necessarily reflect the service standard of what goes on to uh, attempt to resolve the request. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I don't see anybody else. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, do you mind if I just keep going? I've just got a few more. Well, two more. Uh, you got two minutes left, and then I'm going to speak, and then maybe if you want to come back for three minutes, you can do so. Okay. Um, on page 28 of the report, we have customer feedback comparison. Um, this uh, has transit technology at 2% and 1%, and bus operators at 53 and 44%, and excessive bus at 7% and 5%. And I'm just I'm wondering what does that mean? Uh, customer feedback to me. Uh, usually implies customer satisfaction, but it doesn't look like that with this chart. I'm, I'm guessing that this had something to do with uh, the types of calls that you received. I'm just not sure what that chart means at all. That's correct. That that refers to the, the percentage of, of calls or interactions with the public that we have relating to those specific categories. Okay, so it is the number of calls not at all related to the customer satisfaction. Correct. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to jump down to page 40 of the report for the last question uh, to uh, the great pleasure of the, mayor, of the uh, chair, I'm sure. Uh, and that is, it talks about the um, on-time performance. And on-time performance is something that I see as absolutely critical. If we want to uh, increase uh, the adoption of transit, we need to make it more reliable and more reliable. Part of it means... Uh, the bus is going to get to where it's going, uh, and, and that's been addressed. Part of it means that it's going to get to where it's going on time, and it's going to show up at my place on time, and connections are going to be made on time. Um, and if, if uh, transit users don't find uh, it to be reliable, they simply won't be able to take it. At this point, uh, we have many of the routes that are achieving the 85% service standard. And I, th and I think that's great. Thank you very much for, uh, the, uh, for the improvements in that over, well, since I've, be, uh, since I've been elected. Um, there are still some that are below the 85%, and one of them is down at 69%. Uh, mm -hmm. And with that route down at 69%, um, that means that if you, especially if you have a connection to another bus, you are likely going to be late for your appointment, your work or your doctor's appointment or whatever, uh, between one and three times a week. Um, and that's just getting to it. You would also be late getting home because you would miss a connection or, or for whatever reason. Uh, I'm just wondering what you have in place as far as improving the rest of uh, those routes to get them up to the 85% of, of the uh, on-time rate. Sure, Dave, would you uh, like to take a stab at this one or you want me to? <laughs> um, unfortunately, it's not a simple answer because there's a lot of different factors. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll kind of go through a few different things. Um, one, of the, one of the overall challenges with scheduled adherence is that it, it really is a balance. Um, you know, we, we want the service to be, to be predictable, to be reliable. Um, at the same time, if, if we ever came forward with a chart where it was 100% scheduled adherence across the board, that probably means we have a lot of buses sitting around because it is difficult to predict and to have um, accurate accuracy of, um, uh, of, of the route. Uh, sorry, what I'm trying to say is traffic, you know, traffic is dynamic. Um, there's various things that can happen throughout the day that can have impacts. Um, you know, in the case of the, 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 the lowest one, there's 69, I think that's through 433. And, and in that case specifically, we are actually making uh, schedule changes in November to, to deal with some of the scheduled here, it's issues there. So that's why where we have the, you know, we look at the 85% as a whole. Um, also, when we see routes dipping below that, then we can start digging into those routes uh, to try and figure out what the cause is. Um, and sometimes it's a structural schedule issue that, you know, just needs a change. 
Um, in the case of the, the 433, it's, it's probably a more minor schedule adjustment. So we can do it without needing, you know, more resources, more people, more buses. Um, sometimes, it, you know, if it is a bigger issue that requires people and resources, that has to go to a future budget year. The other thing we would, we would look at and consider is, is there any kind of uh, temporary local condition that's leading to it? So, um, you know, we've seen some of our routes drop uh, low uh, when we've had construction in some, you know, some critical places like, um, you know, paving on South Park or, or um, there was a construction project recently where we were detouring around Spring Garden Road, um, you know, so various things like that. So, there's no really one simple answer, I guess. It's about, you know, identifying where the issues are, seeing what's, you know, what will actually help it. Um, and then the bigger picture comes down to transit priority. And, you know, as Mark had mentioned in the presentation, having the, uh, you know, have, having the, the Bears Road uh, transit priority lane go through, you know, that has done wonders for the scheduled adherence of a lot of the routes that go through there. I mean, the numbers would have been astoundingly bad for some of those, routes, particularly uh, PM rush hours. So, um, Sorry, a bit of a ramble, Councillor, but it's uh, it was scheduled here. And it's it's uh, there's not really any one simple answer in the way we tackle it. No, and I get that, and I appreciate it. Um, as far as uh, if we were trying to achieve 100, percent I understand uh, that there would be uh, surplus equipment lying around, which is why I haven't asked about uh, when you might be increasing the 85. Um, percent But uh, so I accept that, um, and I also see the differences year over year which would indicate that there was a temporary condition, as you mentioned, with construction. So hopefully uh, that will uh, just get better. Uh, it may affect a quarter, but it shouldn't affect two years uh, consecutive. So thank you very much, uh, Dave and Mark, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh, you're welcome, Councillor Russell. Uh, okay, so uh, it's funny. What you're talking about to me is the one of our biggest problems communicating with the public is the trend lines are good, but very, very jagged. Right. So, uh, you know, we can look at the aggregate and we can even look at it zonally and say, oh, things are moving in the right direction. But if you're the person who was on that bus that was disrupted by the major construction or the bridge being replaced or whatever, it wasn't good for you. And they're not going to accept that as an answer. So there's that dynamic push and pull. I also wanted to say uh, to uh, Councillor Outfit that uh, I'm still waiting for the Spring Garden Road shelters. It's a supply chain issue, right? Like they're they're a year behind and that's not anybody on staff's fault. It's they're coming, but, uh, but they're not here yet. And there's a number of, uh, what was the phrase that I heard from staff? The uh, uh, I have at least one shelter that was uh, uh, removed uh, inadvertently or accidentally or unexpectedly. It's like when a car crashes into it or something like that. And that hasn't been replaced yet either. Uh, and it's been a number of months. Uh, so my questions are going back to the actual stats. So the, the mean distance between failure data is really interesting to me and really good. And that's something I want to like kudos to, to staff. Uh, Mr. Santilli, Mr. Riga, because they have worked really hard to make that happen. Like that is something that we've talked about at this committee for the 10 years that I've been here. And and to see significant changes, 36% increase in kilometers between uh, failures on conventional buses is what I what I saw. Can you talk a little bit? I, I have it's a couple questions, so I'll do them all at once. And then I'd like you to talk a little bit about what's happening there, why that's happening, make sure that that's not... Uh, but I'm not misreading the data or it's because we have less buses on the road or the older buses are in the garage because we have, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, second question was 24% uh, growth year on year is good. I didn't see in there, but I think I saw some statistics in a memo we may have gotten. I think it needs to be uh, front and center for the public. How are we doing compared to other transit properties in terms of recovery uh, to post COVID numbers? And I think we're doing well is what I recall, but I think the public also wants to see that. And then I'm not going to ask detailed questions about this, uh, but I think it needs to be owned and, and owned publicly because the public is is facing the challenges is that a lot of our adherence and ability to deliver reliability is being impacted by uh, the labor uh, issues that we're having in terms of staffing uh, bus routes right now. And I think, um, you know, Part of why we had this meeting when there's very little on the agenda is you don't want the quarterly reports to become so old that you're going to have two quarterly reports at once and we're going to have another quarterly report shortly. And I think that report needs to have some uh, quantification, some quants in it about uh, how many routes we're unable to deliver. And I think that we also need to hear from staff about what's being done and what the timeline is to restore that. And I've already spoken to Mr. Rigi, a big concern I've heard, especially from the St. Mary Student Association, I had a great meeting with them a month ago, is 
will these routes by and large be back in place before school starts? Because more and more students are living farther and farther away as the core becomes more expensive and they need to be able to get to school and, and get back. So there's a lot of concern in the community about that. We sure don't want those kids to start driving in, right? That'll only make it worse. So uh, those were my three questions and my comment. I think we need to have the, the, the issues around uh, routes that were approved but not delivered. We need to acknowledge that and enumerate that and talk about how we're going to fix it. But so those three questions over to staff. Thank you. Maybe I'll ask, uh, I see uh, Bill Cutler is here. Uh, I'll ask him to uh, speak to the mean distance uh, between failure question and then I can cover the rest. Thank you. Happy to, uh, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Chair, uh, Mr. Chair, through you, uh, um, uh, actually, Mr. Chair, was you that asked the question? I'm sorry, I'm gapping here. I'm looking at my KPIs as I speak. Uh, simply put, um, cost per kilometer and our mean distance between failure are improving um, solely because our economic replacement point was once never or make it last as long as possible. We're a slowly increasing that to uh, 14 years and we're incrementally getting closer to that. With a 14 year replacement point, we're getting a refresh of newer buses. This takes a long time as you can appreciate, but as we get incrementally close to that, we're fitting within the envelope of warranties and our extended warranties while raising the upfront cost of the bus are starting now to show um, a lot of recovery to the tune of $100,000 a year. Uh, so our, our, it's, it's all having a domino effect. The newer equipment, fewer breakdowns, better warranties through spec writing. Um, and then, uh, you know, I just, one, one subtle, um, bragging point is uh, with the low staff that we've um, talked about with attendance issues, et cetera, you know, meeting these preventative maintenance schedules within fleet has been um, a test to their, you know, how, how resolute the team is and keeping the service up and running clean, safe and reliable. Thank you for that. I just want to say, I remember the presentation on maybe even moving it to a replacement every 12 years. Uh, and being able to no longer do the midlife refit piece. And, and I, I think it's really important that the committee recognize that this is this 14 year replacement piece is what's is, is driving this reliability. And it was very controversial at the time and 12 was even more so, which is why we haven't done it yet. But anyway, to, to my other two questions over to Dave. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cutler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Maybe just before I dive into those, I do, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll take executive director of privilege and just, uh, Bill's a bit humble, and I think, you know, buying buses, uh, replacing older buses is certainly one thing, but uh, Bill's entire team in, uh, in Transit Fleet really does a fantastic job to keep these assets running and uh, to improve maintenance practices. So um, there's certainly a lot that goes into there, and they, they do a great job to keep these uh, you know, very expensive assets that, frankly, lead very hard lives uh, in what they do on a day-to-day -day basis uh, up and running as much as they do. So certainly kudos to uh, there. Uh, so I'll start. So in terms of uh, COVID recovery, uh, you know, weekends are, are getting actually we're, we've, we've hit 100 percent a few times um, and weekends are generally quite close to pre-COVID levels now. Um, there's fluctuations up and down, but, but they're generally uh, getting quite close to weekend levels. Um, excessive bus generally is also uh, near 100 percent. So we're seeing nearly full recovery there. Um, the, the, the remaining one is weekdays, of course. Um, we're tending to fluctuate, I would say, between maybe high, like 78, 79% of pre-COVID. Uh, we've got up as far as like 85, 86%. Um, again, that does fluctuate. Uh, we've seen some pretty good uptake uh, so far on the, uh, the free summer Fridays as well. So that's been positive to see. Um, in terms of where we rank, we don't, you know, CUDA, Canadian Urban Transit Association, not collecting that data. So I can't necessarily, um, you know, provide a table or something quantitative about that. But, you know, anecdotally, we are still uh, among the highest in the country in terms of recovery. Certainly, you're seeing the big cities uh, lagging behind probably the most. But, um, you know, I, I think we're, we're in pretty good standing and when you look across the country, you know, being uh, in that, that 80 range. I think this fall will be really interesting to see uh, starting in September where the ridership trends go uh, with universities, I think being pretty much all back to in-person learning, because even last year there was still a lot of hybrid going on. So 
uh, that will certainly have a nice a nice booster ridership. But I, I do I do feel confident in saying that we are certainly doing quite well versus our uh, our counterparts parts across the country. Um, so the final piece uh, around staffing. So um, you know I guess what I can say is it's obviously I mean not going to be answer it is a very difficult situation we find ourselves in right now. Um, we had a uh, significant increase in, uh, in retirements and, and things like that over over the, the course of the pandemic. Um, you know we I think like many organizations we we heard about the gray wave coming we heard about it we heard account about it well it actually crashed on us. Uh, it is what's happened you know a lot of people that were retirement eligible and otherwise wouldn't have retired um, decided to, to retire during the pandemic so that that was kind of the beginning of the uh, the hole we find ourselves in um, so current labor market you know certainly uh, is incredibly challenging um, like any other organizations we are struggling to hire uh, we're struggling to recruit so uh, what our team is doing working with human resources is just really getting creative in how we recruit getting out into the communities, um, you know, finding people they maybe would have never seen themselves um, in an occupation like this and, and, and helping them see themselves in an occupation like this. Um, you know, we've had some great meetings with our counterparts at library recently about, um, you know, utilizing a lot of their community connections to get out there um, and, and, and do more recruiting. So, so really, I mean, right now recruiting is, it, it is the thing that is it's an all hands on deck effort. We are uh, doing everything we can to fill the classes, to fill the training classes, um, looking at some opportunities perhaps to, uh, you know, if we have retirees who maybe want to come back and drive, we might be able to expedite their, uh, their, their journey through the training process so that we can bring some of them back into the workforce uh, more quickly. So, you know, we really are tackling the, the recruitment side of things from all angles. Um, it will take time. That, 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 is, that is the reality. We are you know, I would say we're probably about 40 operators short of where we should be right now. So, um, you know, that will take time. For, uh, you for know, context, I, how many operators are there, just so people know the scope of that? I think it's around 640, 650, something like that. Thank you. Um, so so it, is, it, is a, it is a significant chunk. Um, you know, the other side of it is the absenteeism side. Um, you know, it's public information that comes to council around, around absenteeism rates and, and ours um, are Frankly, ours have never been have never been great, so uh, that's another impact that there is high absenteeism. So we are again working with our colleagues in human resources to uh, to tackle that. Um, I think uh, sorry, I just kind of lost my train of thought. I, I think you know ultimately it, it it will take time, and I think you know I guess maybe if I can go to the um, uh, the, the demand side in terms of the service levels. I mean we've We've reduced back pretty much all the service we can without going in and completely rewriting the schedule, which is a very major endeavor. Um, and of course, we've deferred the, uh, the the planned service improvements for November, which was obviously a very difficult decision. I know there's a lot of things in there people were waiting for, um, but with the staffing situation, we simply didn't have a choice and we had to push that forward. So. In terms of you know when will we be back, I think it, it's a really hard question to answer at this point in time. I think I can see that we're starting to turn a corner. Um, when we look at the the employment numbers, I mean we're having we're having a, an easier we're having more people coming into our training classes than we have before, so those numbers are going up. Um, the number of people exiting the organization um, looks to have peaked probably uh, June July were pretty high months, but that number has dropped a lot this month. So. Those are the kind of metrics we're measuring very carefully. How many are coming in? How many are going out? Um, and making sure they're pushing that in the right direction. So I don't have an answer today in terms of you know when will we be back to full staffing. Um, it, it, I mean, it took us a little while to get into the situation, and it will certainly take us a little while to get out. Of it. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, I've certainly seen the training bus around. Uh, more than usual. Uh, Tony Mancini uh, asks, uh, how long does it take for a train to train a driver that has no experience? So it's uh, so it's a seven, seven weeks in total, uh, six weeks uh, of both classroom and then practical driver training. Um, and then a, a seventh week is out with uh, mentors. We, we pair them up with a uh, with an experienced operator um, who can, uh, so the, the, the trainee will actually, you know, dr drive the bus for the week. Um, uh, under the uh, under the, the assistance of a trained operator, yeah. So seven weeks. Thank you for that. 
There's no further questions. So I guess that's it, uh, uh, staff. Thank you very much for this presentation. I look forward to the next quarterly report in a month, I guess. I don't know, maybe two. I uh, really appreciate you being here today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, this means that we move now to 12.2 members of the standing committee, 12.2.1. Councillor Mancini, uh, you have a motion to put on the floor. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll put the uh, following motion on the floor that the Transportation Standing Committee requests the Chief Administrative Officer to prepare a staff report that outlines opportunities and challenges related to a public safety in the Halifax transit system and options to mitigate these challenges. So move. Second. Moved by Councillor Mancini, second by Councillor Kent. Councillor Mancini, on your motion. Thank you, Councillor Kent. Thank you, colleagues. So, uh, you know, we've had a lot going on, and Dave just talked about the the pressures uh, on our transit system right now. Uh, we I've continued to hear from residents and even um, transit staff about concerns about safety at particularly our, our bus terminals. Uh, we have a lot of folks that uh, are using the terminals as a place to uh, get out of the weather, uh, utilize our Wi-Fi, use the washroom. Uh, there's some behavior that's not appropriate behavior. In no way am I suggesting that anybody that is homeless or living rough, is, uh, they're all folks in this category. But those are some of the folks that we're hearing from staff and riders. Um, there, you know. Our transit staff are, are pressure, under pressure and under stress. So are many of our riders, right? I mean, the, the pandemic has hit everybody. And so I think folks are a little more um, short with one another and, uh, and we've probably seen an increase in conflict. We have what's called our PPA, our protection private property. Uh, and that's so that if someone has done something that's inappropriate or uh, dangerous, that we can have them uh, remove from properties and not to allow them back to our properties. I understand there's some issues of applying that to our buses and our ferries. So you know, is it time, this motion, to take a look at that again? Can we add some more teeth to that? Um, you know, does transit need its own street navigators? Uh, as I hear from uh, transit supervisors that they're concerned and they're, it's not just about enforcement for them. They want to be able to help people that are in need, you know. Um, do are we able to engage with HRP and increase patrols at terminals? Uh, can we have HRP riding some of our most busiest bus routes? You know, other cities have transit police, and don't get excited, folks, on Twitter. I'm not suggesting we have transit police here at HRM, but I'm just, you know, we there. Other cities have ways of uh, dealing with these types of issues. You know, uh, is there a variation of that by having increased patrols? And I know. Uh, HRP is like transit, like many other departments and uh, other organizations uh, under pressure and under uh, understaffed. Um, you know, is there a role in the province when we look at this? I don't know. That's a question mark. Can we engage? I would hope with this motion, the colleagues, that we would engage Dr. Amy Siciliano and the public safety advisory team to be part of this motion to look at our public safety and our staff safety. Um, you know, our transit supervisors, I've spoken to a number of them. They're asking, as I mentioned earlier, they're, they're wanting to help. They're asking for more tools, more training, more skills, more resources, uh, even more power to enforce some things like PPA and so on. So that's the, the purpose of uh, my motion. Uh, we need to make sure transit, like everything in HRM, is safe for not only our citizens, but our employees. And it's been a concern lately. I'm not suggesting that it's not safe to get on a bus or on, a, uh, on the ferry. Uh, but we've seen an increase from uh, not that long ago and maybe prior to the pandemic day. So that's the rationale of my motion. I would also hope to see maybe it's phased in. We get back with something sooner than later, even uh, some low hanging fruit that can address some of these issues. So uh, that's the motion. I'm open to hear from my colleagues. Thank you, Councillor Mancini. There's no one who's, oh, Councillor uh, Kent has put her hand up, which I was lucky to notice. Uh, Councillor Kent. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just, uh, yeah, I just chose that one very quick because I could do that very quick. I didn't want us to pass along. Um, <laughs> thank you, Councillor Mancini, for putting this forward. Um, I had just started to receive a significant number, seeing what seemed like a, a larger number when I was about to take some time off for myself and my family. And then, of course, I'm back and I'm trying to get caught up and there's a lot there. And I think, you know, anytime we have um, issues around and concerns around this kind of safety. And we have, as Councilman Senior has spoken to, the, 
the the drivers themselves and the and this uh, uh, staff saying we want to help, we want to be part of change. That's that's encouraging. That's what we that's what we want to hear. We want to have that. So I think this is a really positive step forward. I think it's needed, and um, I want to reinforce that approach that they've taken to to transit. We don't always get that kind of approach. <laughs> Just want solutions without being willing to put in some, you know, energy into the game. So I, I'm happy to support it. I hope the others will as well. And um, look forward to seeing something come about, some positive uh, recommendations come forward. Thank you for that. Yeah, I think uh, a public safety, potentially non-constabulary, if I may speak from the chair, uh, I've been to a couple of meetings with Councillor Mancini and with staff. I, I, I think that we recognize things need to change. We may need to empower or have additional resources that aren't the transit supervisors that may not be their role. Uh, that's something that we're going to have to think about. And certainly, uh, we don't want to go back. I remember there were times when I was in high school in uh, Dartmouth that you you didn't want to take transit after dark. It was scary, right? And and we don't want to go back to that. We need the service that we're investing so much time in, and so many people count on to 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 be uh, to be and to be felt to be safe by people at all times. So I thank you for bringing this uh forward councillor mancini uh to close and then we'll have a vote go ahead yeah, just a quick close i i know this i don't believe the cao is online here maybe dave you chime in uh, i'm concerned of the timing of this because this is quite complex uh you know is there a way to get at least uh, as i alluded to earlier the some low-hanging fruit uh and get back to us the rather quickly on that and and then maybe point us in the direction where the overall motion is going because uh, this is not something we can wait you know, really, in my opinion, six, eight months, we need to address some of this stuff right away. And uh, I understand other things are longer term. So, Dave, I don't know if you were able to comment uh, who's doing the work, but uh, is there anyth anything on timing? I, yeah, through the chair, it would be hard to comment on timing right now because I think we really need to dive into it and see. That, I mean, I have a sense of the scale we're dealing with, and, and most of it is very big. I, I'm, so, in terms of, you know, are there low hanging fruit? I think certainly if we identify things along the way that uh, can come back quicker. We can certainly, you know, I certainly be open to bringing that back. Um, you know, in terms of one other piece of information, I think it would be uh, perhaps of interest. So we have a new uh, director of transit operations starting September 12th, um, Bill Harris, who actually is a, a former H Halifax Transit employee uh, returning from Edmonton, uh, where uh, in his role as director of operations there, he would have had uh, a transit security function working for him as well. So this will be uh, one of the first things uh, that Bill will have on his desk when he starts with us. And I think he's got a lot of experience in this area, which will certainly help, um, you know, come to some of the conclusions uh, in terms of where we need to go. But yeah, I mean, absolutely. If there's, you know, we're, I don't want to belabor this longer than it needs to. So if there's things we can do quickly, we're certainly open to bringing those back. And sorry, what's Phil's uh, title going to be? His role again? Sorry, he's the uh, new director of transit operations. Okay, yeah. Thanks, Dave. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I hope somebody told him he's not cashing out of Edmonton and coming back to buy a big cheap house here. I hope. I hope, I hope <laughs> <somebody> <laughs> told him he's exchanged. Maybe you're watching. <laughs> sorry, Dave. Uh, <laughs> all right. So uh, no one else is on the list. So we'll move to a vote. All those in favor of the motion. Aye. 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 Pass Aye. against. Passes unanimously. Thank you, Councilor Mancini. So that uh, completes, just lost track. That's the end of uh, members of the standing committee. There are no motion section 13. That brings us to in-camera section 14. And uh, if someone would care to move the uh, in-camera minutes of June 23rd. So moved. Moved by Councilor Russell. Second um, by Councilor Mancini. Uh, any, anyone require discussion of those in-camera? Seeing none, we'll move to a vote. All those in favor of the in-camera minutes of June 23rd? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carries, thank you. There are known added items. Do any councillors have any notices of motion? If I may, I have a notice of motion I'll read from the chair and uh, to the legislative assistant, I'll email this to you shortly. Uh, I take notice at a future meeting of the Transportation Standing Committee, I will move the following. The Transportation Standing Committee requests a staff report which outlines the 
process for short and long-term traffic diversion from municipal streets, full or partial, for the purposes of creating pedestrian-focused spaces, events, and activations. The report should outline any required regulations or regulatory changes, consultation requirements, stakeholder, organizer, and municipal responsibilities and authorities along with an appeal process. All right, so no further notices of motion. That moves us to public participation. And wonderfully, there is a registered speaker, uh, Mitch Van Oosten. If I said that correctly, please uh, turn on your camera. There you are. You're a very patient person, both with the meeting and your persistence to get to this point. And I appreciate that. I want you to know that. So without further ado, you have five minutes. Uh, welcome to the committee. OK, thanks a lot. Can you hear me OK? Yep. Great. Fabulous. So I have two outstanding um, file numbers. Uh, I don't know if it's helpful to just state those now so they're on record or if I can put them in the chat or in an email later on. Um, but I uh, have them in the email, so uh, but you can read them if you'd like. OK, yeah, so um, 22589.59 and 22645.72. Um, I first wrote in to the 311 uh, email address on the 21st of July. Um, and really what I'm hoping to, to ask and what I've written in the email as well is um, for Halifax Transit to update uh, and sort of maybe modernize might be a word. I don't know if it's a version control issue or what it is, but the use of the system called general transit feed specification. So this is the system that um, allows the transit system to put its routes and um, timings and stops on Google Maps and on another app called Transit App. Um, so when somebody uses Google Maps, this is a system that Google uses to understand where the buses should be and, and when they should stop. Um, when routes are on detour at the moment, what I've noticed is that Halifax Transit, instead of updating the real stops and timings for that detour, there's just a little yellow note that says this route's on detour these are the turns it's going to take and it and somebody has to sort of guess a user has to guess where the stops are going to be and so google will try and give you the best um, route to take um, based on the existing data but if that route's on detour for example and the specific example that i've been running into is the route four which is detouring around Spring Garden Road at the moment. So Google thinks in general, it's the best route for me to take from my house in um, the North End to where I work at the Maritime Building in downtown. Um, so it will tell me to take the four all the way to the end of Spring Garden, um, which is not actually a real option at the moment because it's on detour. So when I've used Google Transit or other transit apps in other cities where detours have been happening, those those detour stops and routes are updated for real on the on the app. And so people are able to then choose the optimal route, acknowledging that, that some routes are on detour. So it might tell you instead to take the one or instead to take the 10 or some other route that is actually available because it's not on detour. So that's what I'm hoping that Halifax Transit can, can adopt. And, and I hope that that would be quite a low cost and, and easy thing to do. Well, thank you very much, Mitch. We appreciate you coming. You've been even excellent on this. Uh, it's kind of advocacy that's great to see citizens undertaking, uh, not letting go dog with a bone, all those jokes. Uh, so uh, questions of clarification from the committee. I'm seeing none. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in. Uh, you, you had mentioned that you had seen it in other cities. I'm sorry for not putting in this in the chat. Um, for the uh, detours that had happened in other cities, were they a short-term detour or a long-term? So if it was a detour for a day or a week, uh, would you have noticed if, if that was one of the ones that was updated or, or would it have just been a longer term, a uh, six month or something detour? Uh, yeah, from, from memory, even a, a one day detour for a, a public event or something would also be reflected, yeah. Okay, thank you. 
for my part, I've, I've seen that too. And one of my daughters at school in Montreal. So, uh, so the way the process works, and I, I, it's been so long since we've actually had a, had someone speak at this, is that uh, uh, we ask questions of clarification. Uh, the cap committee would take it away. There may be a motion or follow up with staff to to get some more official stuff at a later date, but we wouldn't do that today. We would we would do that at the next meeting or subsequent meetings. So, uh, thank you very much for your time coming here today. Really appreciate it. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, all right, uh, team. So that's the end of public participation. Uh, the last thing on our agenda is the date of the next meeting is October 3rd, 2022. I'd like to thank, uh, uh, to apologize for that being moved. I have Green Municipal Fund Council and some other people had some conflicts around that as well at that time. So I, I couldn't attend and and uh, apparently it's quite a hefty agenda. So be warned, It's uh, it was felt that it would be better to have all hands on deck by Katie. Uh, so, uh, uh, Councillor Stoddard, as Vice Chair, and I agreed to move it. Uh, so, October 3rd, and your uh, meeting invite has been updated. It will be face to face. So, uh, without further ado, uh, could I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Moved by Councillor uh, Russell, I think, was faster than Councillor Kent, but it was kind of a tie. So, Katie can pick. We are adjourned. Thank you very much, everybody. You have a great remainder of the day. Thank you. We'll see you later.